Masechet Kitin Daf Tet Zayin. We were talking about the laws of combining two different methodologies. Uh, we started off talking about the ratification of signatures in a get. Uh, you can ratify them both with the usual method of ratifying signatures by having two witnesses tes testify to each of the signatures, or the signatories themselves coming and saying, this is my signature, or the court can compare the signatures to other documents that were already ratified. That you can do for any financial document, and you can do it for both on the, on the get. Or for a get, you have a special law that the, messen, that the messenger can say, and then that will be acceptable as ratification. And he can do that for both signatures. So that's okay if you do both signatures one way or both the other way. The problem is doing one signature with one method and the other signature with another method. And so we saw it's a problem to combine these two different methodologies. Since we're on this topic, uh, so then we saw uh, this case also that looks kind of like a lopsided ping pong table, but actually this is an embankment. And so if you have a reshut here and a reshut there, and you want to know, is this a reshut yachid? Um, if it's, let's say, surrounded all, the, all around, uh, by a, well, five tefachim um, uh, that goes down, let's say this top one, you live on the top one, and so five tefachim go down, and five tefachim have a wall that goes up. Well, if it was all down, then that would be fine. If it was all up, that would be fine. But can you combine five down and five up? And Rav Chista said no, but Amemar said that yes, you can do that as long as you have all together ten. So that was the second case we saw. And now we're going to talk about Nitilat Yadayim, Ba'e Ilfa. Ilfa, a famous sage and uh, a contemporary to Rabbi Yochanan, not as famous as Rabbi Yochanan, uh, but uh, when Rabbi Yochanan continued uh, in the Bet Midrash, Ilfa went out for business. And people said, oh, I guess Ilfa, you know, doesn't, uh, uh, probably doesn't remember his learning uh, as much because he went and, and, and did business. Ilfa uh, went up to the top of a mast of a ship and said, anyone can ask me a question. If I can't find a Baraita to answer it, I will jump to my death. And luckily he was able to answer all the questions. Okay, so he went to business but still remained uh, greatest of sages. So he has a question. Um, hand, regarding hands, can they be purified in half, half, halfway, or can they not be purified halfway? Now, this is not a clear question. So we're going to try to figure out what did he mean by this purification of hands halfway? If he's talking about that one is trying to um, wash two hands from the same single cup uh, that has a rivi'it of water in it, well, that's certainly okay. Um, uh, we're talking about, th try to think of uh, someone has a, a rivi'it cup and he's going to pour it on your hands, both of your hands together. You're holding your hands together and he's going to pour it on both of your hands. Well, that certainly is, a, is, is sufficient because the Mishnah Yadayim says if you have a rivi'it of water, you could do Nitilat Yadayim not only for one person, even for two people. Um, you can have, uh, uh, you, you can put them together. Um, so you have, you know, all, all four hands together and you pour it if you eat, even that would be fine. So certainly that would be okay. Uh, one note of introduction about Nitilat Yadayim is that this is all Dirabanan. On the Doraita level, either your whole body is Tameh or your whole body is Tahor. But the rabbis added an extra stringency for certain cases like Tiruma. So people will keep away. And so I said, even your hands become tameh, but you don't have to go and put them in a mikveh. You can, by the way, if you put your hands in a mikveh, then that's even better. It's, you know, if you're at the ocean and you're going to eat a sandwich, um, so, and you don't have a cup around, that's totally fine. Just dip your hands in the ocean and that's, that's the best way possible. Um, so, uh, or you can use a, a cup of water, um, but then that has to have a rivi'it. And incidentally, if you have a rivi'it of water, you don't need to do it three times um, because as you see here, that a rivi'it is sufficient uh, to pour just once. Okay, so anyway, this can't be the question of Ilfa because Ilfa knows the Mishnayot and he knows this Mishnah that says if you have one uh, rivi'it of water, that's sufficient even for two hands, even for four hands. Oh, so maybe it's talking about uh, the qu question is can you uh, 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 make tahor each hand separately? You're not putting their hands together. Can you make one hand tahor and then the other one do it afterwards? 
or does it have to be at the same time? And but this also can't be the question because it's also a, a clear Mishnah. This Mishnah says that if also you wanna do you wanna cleanse one hand, make it tahor through netila with a vessel pouring water on it, and the other other one you're gonna do shtifa, meaning immerse it in a river. Um, so both are good ways to do it, and you can combine two different methodologies here. And so certainly if you're doing two, di two different methodologies, then you're, you're doing it uh, separately at separate times. Um, and uh, so if, if you can do that, then for sure, if you're using the same methodology, you can wash one hand first, and then you can wash the other hand, which is a lot more convenient um, if you're alone. And uh, if there's someone else there, they can pour water on your hands, but if you're alone, so then you need one hand to pour on one and the other hand pour on the other like we usually do. And so that's totally fine. So it can't be Ilfa was referring to that when he asked, can you wash hands for, you know, a, a halfway? Uh, he can't be talking about one hand and then the other. Rather, must be Ilfa's talk asking a question, can you wash a half of a hand and then wash the other half of the hand, right? You wash a couple of fingers and then you wash the other half. Um, is that permitted or do you have to wash an entire hand at once? But that also is obvious. Not from a Mishnah, but it is from a Baraita from the school of the Bianai, that hands, you cannot make them tahor halfway. And Ilfa knows all the Baraita as well. I don't know, all. He knows, right? He knows, he would know this Baraita, so it can't be that he um, is asking this question. So, oh, here's we're making it more complicated. What if the hand is damp? So you wash half of the hand, but you don't dry the hand. Uh, totally, it's still damp. And then you wash the other half. And so, well, since it's still damp, maybe you'll say that the dampness that is already on one half will connect with the, uh, the wetness on the other half when you wash the other half. The dampness will uh, spread and uh, act as um, a, as a connection so that all of it uh, will is, uh, is actually being cleansed at once because it's still damp. Um, so maybe that's that. Maybe that's what his question was. But then we say no, that can't be because even if the hand is damp, that will that help? That can't be because there's a Mishnah in Masechet Taharot that says a stream of water and water that's going down on an incline um, and what and something that is uh, uh, damp, so it's a, a, an item that is damp from water. All these three things are not a connection, not for Tum'ah and not for Tahara. Let's give an example of Nitzok. You have uh, two vessels, one above and one below, and you're pouring from the one above into the into the vessel below. And let's say the one below is Tameh, but the one on top is Tahor. So the question is, while you're pouring from the Tahor into the Tameh, does the Tum'ah go up through, through the up, uh, upstream, through the water, and make a connection? Is this flowing water considered a connection? The rabbis say, no, it's not. This happens to be a huge controversy because the Dead Sea sect in the halachic letter says, yes, it is a connection. But then they know that the Pharisees disagree, and here you see the Pharisees, in fact, do the rabbis do disagree. So they say that a water is this a water stream is not a connection. Similarly, if it was on a slope and and pouring down, um, uh, also the tumah would not go upstream through it. And similarly, if it was if both were on something damp, the dampness of that item would not connect the two. So that's the not le tumah. It also does not connect le tahora such that if you have, um, let's say, two, uh, two uh, pools of water, each one is less than 40 se'ah, right? You have one is 30 se'ah down here, and one is 30 se'ah up here. But they're being connected through a stream, or through something damp, or through something running down a slope. Does that connect the two together so that altogether you have 40 se'ah? The answer is no, right? It will not connect them together. Um, so it does not connect, not for Tumah and not for Tahara. And since we see here that Mashket Tofeach, meaning something damp, does not serve as a connection, so therefore we can't be asking where if I 
if I uh, clean, if I make tahor, one half of my hand, but it's still damp, so maybe that'll act as a sufficient connection when I clean the other half of my hand so that the whole thing is, is cleansed at once, because we just saw that dampness is not a sufficient of a connection. As a tangent, um, this is an important halakha for modern mikvaot because almost all modern mikvaot are made um, uh, by having a connection between two pools of water. One pool is from rainwater, that would be a kosher mikveh. But that, no one, no one dunks in that one. That one stays untouched for many months at a time. Uh, whereas then you have another pool that you fill up with just regular water, Mayim she'uvin, tap water, and that you change every day or, or two, so to keep it clean. The problem is that that by itself would not be a kosher mikveh because you just uh, filled it up with uh, mayim she'uvin. So here's what you do. You take the kosher mikveh that no one uh, uh, dunks in and the other one, and there's a wall between, and in the wall there's a hole. So usually you plug up the hole, but then you unplug it, and so the two mikvaot, the two pools of water, are connected. If you do that, if you connect regular water through a hole to a mikveh, then all of the water becomes a kosher mikveh, and then you can plug up the hole again, and now the, the uh, uh, regular water that was in the, um, in, the, in the pool that people do dunk in becomes a kosher mikveh. So that is permitted. It's not the same as this case. Why? How come over here we said that a nisok is not a chibur, but that's what we do all the time. And the answer is because here we're talking about where, uh, in this gemara, we're talking about where each one is less than 40. So you can't combine, they can't combine together to make a mikveh um, as, uh, if each one is less than 40. However, if one of them is, is a mikveh in and of itself, it's already a kosher mikveh, then it can simply connect to another body of water and and give, and give that the status of a mikveh as well so uh, that is um, a uh, important halakha and makes it much easier to have a fresh uh, health fresh water and a mikveh all the time okay so and uh, now we're back to our question what was ilfa's question can't be that swimming about something damp because something damp is not sufficient to be a connection. Not just damp, but something very wet. So wet that if you touch it, it will make something else damp. So if the hands are, if you uh, wash half a hand and you're not, it's not dry at all, it's still dripping wet. So wet that if something else would touch it, it would also become wet. And then you, so you do half the hand, and then you do the other half afterwards. Is that okay or not? But that can't be Ilfa's question because we have a Braita, and we're assuming Ilfa knows all these Braita that that all is a connection. If it's very, very wet, then that's sufficient, a sufficient connection to connect the, the two. And then so it's like being, it's, it's like being washed all together at once. So Dilma Linyan Mikvaot Rivirbiudahi Titnan Mikvesh Yesh Bo Arbaim Sea Mehuvanot Vyadu Shanaim Vetablu Shanem Batahatorim Bizaharze Rishon Tahor Vasheni uh Vashani Tame. Says, hold on, maybe that halacha that a very something very wet is considered a connection. Maybe that's only for a, a, the love of a, of a mikveh, but not necessarily for hands. And this, um, this Baraita would be the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, as we see in the following Mishnah. If you have a mikveh, that's exactly, precisely 40 se'ah, which means if you take a little bit out, then it would no longer be a good mikveh. Now, two people go and dunk at the same time. That's fine. And people going in, right, so just, I mean, the, it will raise the water level, but there's still the same amount of water in it. And so both of them can dunk at the same time, and they both will be tahor. But what if one goes in first and comes out? Well, when he leak out, comes out, he's coming out wet, which means he's taking a little bit of water out of the mikveh. That means the second person that goes in is going into a mikveh with less than 40 salve water. So if they go one after the other, the first one's okay, but the second one is not going to be okay. Now, everybody agrees to that. Here's the thing. Rebiyuda says, listen, I have a simple, simple solution. If they don't want to both go in at the same time, maybe there's not so much room in there. So then one can go in and come out, but leave his foot in the, in the mikveh. And that way, 
since his foot is still in the mikveh, so he and uh, his he's touching it, and all the water on his body, which is very wet because he's not he didn't dry himself at all, he's dripping wet. All that will be a considered a connection, and so it's even though he's out of the mikveh mostly, but his foot is in the mikveh, it's all a connection, and the second one will also be tahor because he um, is in the mikveh that still has 40 se'ah. And so that baraita is talking about, maybe talking about the mikveh only, um, and, uh, and be the opinion of the biyuda. But we still don't know regarding hand impurity, and if I wash one hand and that's, and that's, um, and that's very wet, and the other hand, then I, I wash the other half of the hand, would that be good? So we don't have a clear answer to that. And so finally, when we have a candidate for what Ilfa's question is. Strangely enough, after all this discussion of what was his question, we actually don't answer the question. So this is like Jeopardy, right? We're, we're successful that we understand the question even, um, and uh, we don't have an answer. Okay, but we do ask now a related question. So the Bimiya says, we know that there's a Mishnah in Zavim that teaches that someone who went to the Mikveh, he's Tahor, but then after he went to the Mikveh, right, soon after, um, he uh, goes into um, a, a pool of Maim Sheuvin, of drawn water, so not a kosher mikveh, right? He goes into a pool, his head and most of his body, so that's a problem. And similarly, a Tahor person, he just went to the mikveh, and now, instead of going into a pool of water, a lot of water gets poured on him. Um, how much? Three lugin of Maim Sheuvin is poured on his head and most of his body. He is Tameh. Now, what's the reason? He already went to the, went to the mikveh, so he should be Tameh. Tahor. So, and Medoraita, he is Tahor. However, the rabbis made a Gezara. They said, listen, if you go to the mikveh and then you go and uh, uh, go into a regular pool or a shower right afterwards, and it makes sense people may want to do that because mikvaot, especially in those days, would be could be uh, dirty. And so then, the person went to the mikveh, they may want to clean off from the dirt that was in the mikveh. But this is a problem because if people regularly do this, then someone who not doesn't know all the halachot so well will say, let's see, oh, someone is ta tameh. So what's the ritual? First, you have to go into some dirty water, right, into a, you know, whatever, a, uh, a lake or something, and then you, uh, you clean yourself off in a shower. So, you know what? Sounds like the shower is the clean part. Uh, maybe you just need the shower, and I could do away with actually dunking into the lake. And so people will think that, and they'll uh, do away with the mikveh part of it and only do the shower part. So the rabbis were afraid of that. So they said, therefore, you know what? If you're going to go and you want to be tahor, you're going to want to go eat teruma. Um, you go to the mikveh, very good. Only go to the mikveh. Uh, you can dry yourself off. There's some Kabbalists today that say you shouldn't dry yourself off, but that's much later uh, idea. So, yeah, you just uh, dry yourself off. Don't take a shower. Go and uh, uh, eat some teruma. And then after that, if you want to shower, it's only like you can't shower forever. You just kind of use it, show that, yes, I am tahor. Do something that a tahor person uh, would do, and then shower later. Um, that is the halacha. That's in the Mishnah. Now here's the question: What if you want? To, what if happens? Happens half half. Um, half on uh, half of you falls in, goes into a pool, right? Only your right half, and then your left half goes into a shower. Is that a problem, right? Or is that okay? I want to clean off. You the the gezera was only if uh, you either put most of your body and uh, uh, your head and most of your body into a pool or it has most of your body into a shower. But if we clean half one way and clean half the other way, well, what's the law regarding that? Take off. So we don't know. It's left standing. Um, this is important and relevant halacha today, even though nowadays we don't have, uh, we're not eating turumah. And so 
um, uh, we uh, don't. We, we are not going to mikveh for that reason. But what about going to mikveh for mikveh for other reasons? Especially a woman who is nida, she goes to the mikveh. Can she shower right after she goes to the mikveh? Ashkenazim are machmirim on this because the Ramah says so. And uh, according to Ash- Ashkenazim, they would say that one has to uh, not shower in the same place. Either they have to be with their husbands first, or at least touch their husbands first, or go to a different uh, building first. Right? Have some kind kind of separation, do something uh, that shows the the um, the uh, mikveh. That was the tahara process. Look, now I just touched my husband, see? And then after, and then sometime after, uh, they could take a shower. However, uh, Svaradim do not say this, and Svaradim say this is in halakha only for eating terumah, but it's never applied to anida, and therefore anida would not have to. Um, similarly, with men who, who want to go to the mikveh, for, you know, Erev Dosh Hashanah or so on. Well, that's all customary. And so, if according to Sfaradim, if it doesn't apply to Isha Nida, certainly it would not apply to a man. Um, although many do, many people do have the custom to apply this also. And they like to have the Mikveh waters be the last thing that they touched as uh, they consider it to be um, holy. And so it's a chumrah that one can take, but uh, this technical, technical halakha uh, will not apply, at least according to Svaradim, in most cases today. All right, so now, Amara Papa, Hare Amru Baal Keri Chole, Shinatnu Alav Tisha Kabin Mayim Tahor, Baera Papa, Chesyo Betfila, Chesyo Benitila, Mai Teko, a very similar question regarding a Baal Keri. Um, so anyone who see has a, semin- a seminal omission, whether on purpose, by mistake, with his wife, any, it doesn't matter how, that person becomes Tameh. Now, this that's a regular type of Tumah that's mentioned in the Torah. But in addition to that, at the time of Ezra, they made a Takana that someone who has who is a Baal Kedi cannot study Torah or pray. Now, um, so this was, this was a, you know, an extra stringency, but many people could not hold by it. And so that, therefore, later it was disbanded. Um, so this a Baal Kedi um, who is sick, and let's say sick, and he cannot go into it, it'd be uh, difficult for him to go and find the Mikveh. So now what's he going to do? He wants to say Kedi HaChema. He wants to pray. What should he do? Um, so there's a leniency and say just put Tisha Kabin water on, on him, pour a lot of a lot of water on him, and that would be Tahor. So this would not be good for anyone that actually needs a mikveh, who is actually uh, midoraita tameh, but for the purposes of Balkedi, so we could have this leniency. So within this law, the Papa asks, uh, what if he goes to half of him goes to the mikveh and half of him gets the nine kabim poured on him? Would that be would that person be uh, good to go as a Balkedi? And we leave that question standing as well. We now return to the Mishnah, a case of Echadome Befanai Nechtav, Echadome Befanai Nechtam. One person uh, says they saw the writing and one says, pers- person says they saw the signatures, uh, but these are two different people. And we said this is invalid. We're now going to see two different interpretations about the, 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 the um, identity of these two people. Are they both agents or is one an agent and one is not an agent? Okay, um, these will be both in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. These are two different versions of the tradition in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. So here's version number one. Amar Rav Shmuel Bar Yehuda, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Lo shenu ela she'en haget yosem mitachad yedeh shenehem, aval get yosem mitachad yedeh shenehem, kasher. When the Mishnah says, one person said befanai nechtam, one said befanai nechtam, we're talking about that only one of them is an agent, and the other one is just a, just a person who happened to be there at the time of the signature or at the time of the writing, but was not appointed by the husband to be an agent to say, take this to the other court. Now, this other person also uh, traveled and he shows up at the court. But when it says, Yose midach mitachat, it means that the uh, one of the people, people is uh, officially presenting it to the court on behalf of the husband, that is the agent. The other person, not an agent. That's So that's the problem, because now the agent only said one half of the statement, and some other person who's not an agent said the other half of the, of the statement. And this is a problem because the law is that this formula only works if said by an agent. Okay, however, if the get was uh, produced by two agents, the, uh, the husband appointed both of them to take it, then that would be okay. All right. 
Alma Kasava Shanam Shaviu get him that I am, and Sirikin Shayamru Befan Nichtav and Nichtam. Now the Gemara is um, elaborating on this ruling of the Biochanan that was transmitted in the name of uh, by Rav Shemuel Bar Yehuda and saying, wait a second, if it was, even if they were both agents and one said Befanai Nichtam, and one said Bef Nichtav, and one said Befanai Nichtam, if two different people are saying each half of the formula, then that's the same as zero statement, right? Because the whole point of the whole Gezera that uh, the rabbi said is that one agent can say the whole formula. Two agents say, but they, then they both also have to say the whole formula. Saying half a formula is the same as zero. Therefore, the Gemara is inferring from Rabbi Yochanan's statement that when two people come and they are both agents, they don't have to say the formula at all. And in fact, even if they said nothing, it would be fine. Right, so all this is derived from the statement of the Mishnah. Uh, it, because the Mishnah is talking about one person who's an agent and another person who's not an agent and says um, and says it's no good, that means if they were both agents, it would be good. And it would be good not because one of them said Befanai Nikhtab and one said Befanai Nikhtab. It would be good even if they both said nothing because you have two agents. Um, this would follow uh, with, the, with the logic that the reason why you should say the formula is an alternate way to ratify the document. But since there are two agents here, so we don't need the alternate way to ratify a document. The whole problem of Rava was only that we were worried that we won't be able to find people who recognize the signatures in the future. But now you have two people that came. And so now they're here. So if we have a problem, we'll find those two people. And so they don't have to say anything at all. Amar le Abaye. Abaye says to Rav Shemuel Abadi Huda. Uh, who uh, offered this halacha in the name of Yochanan? Ela me'ata sefa de katani shenaim omrim befanenu nechta ve'had omer befanai nechtam pasul ve'rebiuda machshir. This is according to you that it's talking about where one person is an agent and one person is not an agent. In that case, then you'd have to apply the same. A criteria for a next case in the Mishnah where two people say it was written in front of us and yet a third a different person altogether says it was signed in front of uh, in front of me then and that there there that's that's would be the subject of the machloket um and the rabbanan say pasul and abiyuda says it's okay tama de and get your semitachad yet oh so that would only be true because not all three are agents and so you have someone who's not an agent that's um that's saying something um so we can infer from this that if all three of these people were agents then that would be good right according to rabbanan and the rabbanan would say uh, Rabbanan would say in that case it's a kosher. Of course, Rabbi Yehuda would say it's kosher because he says kosher even if they are not all agents. If they are all agents, there would be no machloket. And he's and uh, uh, and um, uh, Rav Shemuel Bar Yehuda says yes. In fact, that would be true in that case as well. And so now we wonder. Okay, so then what is the reason for the machloket when not all of them are agents? Ah, so uh, the Rabbanan th say that it's no good. They pay, say they say pasul. Why? Because they make a gezera. Um, that if you permit it in this case, then people will say, oh, look, you can ratify it, uh, signatures based on one witness, right? Because here we see it says that um, one, per, one witness says, I saw the sign signatures. Um, and if, if you say that's kosher, then people are going to think that's also kosher for other documents. So we make a gezera to say this is not kosher. Um, and because that person is not an agent. If they're an agent, Right, then there's a different story because an agent comes, special law, the rabbi said, if an agent says the full formula, then it's good. But if you're not an agent, then we're going to have to make a gezerah. Whereas uh, the Rebbe says, 
Inan. Okay, we don't have to, we don't uh, bother to make a Gezera because you already had two people that said the Befanai Nichtav. So it's already clear from there that this is a special law that's going to apply to get only and not to something else. And so that's why when you have this other person that say, says Befanai Nichtam, even though it's different from the first two people, according to the Biyuta, there's no need to make a Gezera. It's different from the previous case where it's only one person that says Befanai Nichtav and one person says Befanai Nichtav. Um, there, it's not so clear that this is a special law, and so even Rabbi Yehuda would say that in that case, it's no good. All right, all that was one version. Now, Lishna Harina Amri La, Amar Av Shemuel Bar Yehuda, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Same people, but another version of what this tradition was in name of Rabbi Yochanan. Afilu Gat Ket, Yosef Mitachad Yedesh Shenehem, Pasul, that when, even if they're both agents, you have two people, and both are agents, and one says, Befanai Nichtav, and the other one says, Befanai Nichtam, it's no good, right? One person has to say the entire formula. That's the whole law. This is a special leniency, but all, one person has to say the whole thing. Otherwise, no good. Oh, based on this, we can derive the opposite of what we did before. You see, there are definitely two people here, two agents, and yet... Um, it's not sufficient if one says Befanai Nechtam uh, and the other one says Befanai Nechtam. Both of them need to say the full formula. Um, and uh, we don't we don't say well since it's two then so then it's enough. Now Amada Abaye Elamata Sefa de Katani Shanaim Omerim Befan Nikta Bechado me Befanai Nikhtam Pasul Virudam Mahshir Afilu get your semitah edition hem pasleda la banan and now the same conversation. Abaye asks a question to um Rav Shemuel Bar Yehuda, where according to that, if that's the criteria that everybody's an agent, then you're gonna apply the same thing to the next case where Two people say Befanenu Nichtav, and one person says Befanai Nichtam, and there also all of them are agents, and yet Rabbanan say it's no good, and the Biuda said it's it's okay. Now, even if they are all agents, you would still Rabbanan would say it's no good, and he says yes, indeed, that's what I think. Now, what would be the reason for the machloket if they're all agents? So, what's wrong with it? Must be the rabbis say that people in other lands are not careful or don't know the law that the get has to be written for her sake. And so, one of the reasons why we need this whole statement is to establish that fact. Um, since that is a necessary reason, this was Rabba's reason, um, therefore we need to that it be done properly and it doesn't matter if you have two people here three people here they're all agents no one person said the whole formula and so it's not good you have to do it the right way whereas it be Yehuda um, here in the Mishnah says this case is okay why the only reason that we need uh, this whole statement that holds court is the reason uh, that Rava uh, offered way in the beginning of the of the Gemara that we are, we may not have witnesses to testify to ratify these signatures, but here we have two and even three people who are agents who are coming, and therefore we don't need to ratify it now. If we need to ratify in the future, we'll find one of uh, two of them and we'll be able to ratify it then. And th that is why that that is the essence of the machloket here. Now lema Now according to your explanation just now, you said that rabbanan are following rabba and biuda is following. Rava, or the other way around, actually, Rava is following the Banan, Rava is following the Biuda, and so you see this Machloket Amoraim is actually Machloket Tanaim, which is a problem because why would the Amoraim argue on the same thing that the Tanaim already argue, argued about? So we have to answer this is La Rava Metereskelishna Kama. Each Amora, in fact, can interpret the entire Mishnah, and Rava can will follow the first interpretation, the first version of Rabbi Yochanan, and that was just fine, although see, Rava would not be uh, be consistent with this version. Um, but Rava Amalach and Rava, he can be consistent with the second version, and he would say, In fact, everybody agrees that essentially we have to establish that it was written Lishma, and therefore you need at least one agent to say the full formula. 
Um, but here we're talking about a case where that that would that 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 was true. But here we're talking about a case that the other lands already learned the law that it has to be written, written lishma, right? This was successfully promulgated, and at that point everybody's writing lishma. Well, only thing is, do we have to worry that the situation is going to become corrupt and go back to the bad bad uh, old days again? Rabbanan said, um, uh, that's what Rabbanan said, yes, we have a problem, we, we have to worry that it may go back to the bad old days, and uh, that's why he said it's no good, and Rabbi Uda said, no, we don't have to worry about it, now everybody knows, um, and therefore, um, it's uh, it's okay. Okay, with the flag, with the flag, name the biuda beresha. All right. Now, if the biuda, if this, if in fact we're talking about a case where everybody knows as lishma, and you don't need to make a gezera, then the biuda should also machshir in the previous case where you have one person that says befanai nichtav. And one agent, right? Both agents says befanai nechtam. Um, so then Rabbi Yudah would should say that's also fine because we know we have two people here, so we'll be able to ratify them in the future. And Rabbi Yudah doesn't 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 worry about lishma. Everybody knows lishma. He's not worried about it going back. So does Rabbi Yudah say it's kosher in that case also? Hayit mar ala mar ula halukaya Rabbi Yudah af berishona. Indeed, yes. Um, because Ula says that even though in our Mishnah, Rabbi Yuda only argues on one case, Ula says oh, that, uh, that Rabbi Yuda actually argues on the previous case as well and would say that's kosher. So yes, that isn't, that's the correct interpretation. Challenge to that, Mativ Rav Oshaya Ula, Rabbi Yuda machshir bezo velo We have a braita. It's also found in Tosefta that says, Rabbi Uda says, only this case is kosher, we have two and one, but not in the other case. In the other case, he agrees with Rabbanan. My love, the ma'ute, had omer befanai nechtav, had omer befanai nechtam. So isn't it coming to exclude the case that we've been talking about, where you have one witness that says, one agent that says befanai nechtav, and one agent that says befanai nechtam, and Rabbi Uda there agrees with Rabbanan and says invalid, and that's against Ula. What are we going to do with that? And we say, la le me'ute, no, this beraita is not coming to exclude that case, but to exclude a different case all the way, even before that. Befanai nechtav, ava lo befanai nechtam, nech nechtav. If the agent said it was signed in front of me, but he doesn't say anything about it being written, he says it was not written in front of me, or he doesn't say it was written in front of him. Uh, so he says no one says anything about it being written. That's a much worse case. So, and um, there, uh, that's with the one that Rabbi Uda agrees is invalid. Now, why would we think that he might even say it is valid? We might think since Rabbi Uda does not make a gezera that he's worried that things will go back to the bad old days. Maybe he also doesn't say have a gezera um, that people are going to make mistake a get with other documents and think that oh if you can if I say if he just says befanai nechtam so now I know that for the get that would be good uh, because that ratifies the the signatures on the get and I'm not worried that people will come to make a mistake and use the same method for other financial documents um, and so and uh, he's not making a zera and therefore the biyudah might say it's good kamash malan that's why this braita has to teach us that although the biuda did not make one gezera by going back to the bed all days he does worry that if you say befanai nechtam only then you'll say befanai nechtam oh look you could write a five documents with one signature and this is a get i'm going to do the same thing with others and that's why we require the messenger to say befanai nechtav u befanai nechtam you have to say a full formula because that is an unusual formula and anyone hearing that formula will say, oh, that's for a get, right? A get that has a special law of lishma and all that. The, the writing is important, and that way they will not come to a mistake that you can use that same formula or one witness 
for other types of documents. Itmar name Amar of Yehuda, Shenaim Shevi Uget Mitatayam, Banu Le Machloket, Rebi Yehuda, Ve Rabbanan. We have another statement by yet a different Amora, Rav Yehuda, that uh, confirms that uh, that confirms the interpretation we just mentioned in the name of Ula, um, because here it says two people bring a get from other, another place. This is a machlok between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbanan, right? And not, not only if it's three people that are bringing it, even two people that bring it, and one says Befanai Nechtav, one says Befanai Nechtam, that also would be a machloket between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbanan. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.